Good afternoon, everyone. I would love to welcome you to our presentation today on anti-fraud. I'd like to acknowledge the territorial territories and Indigenous people of each of the communities represented by those in attendance at today's virtual seminar. My name is Narielle Davis, and I will be the moderator for today's talk. I'm a customer service librarian at Burrell. I have been with the library system for about seven years and have worked at both the Cowichan and Sydney branches. I would like to every welcome everyone to this important webinar as part of Burrell's professional series. For today's session, we have partners with, partnered with the British Columbia Securities Commission to talk about investment fraud. We are thrilled to have BCSC's Doug Muir with us today. Doug is the Director of Enforcement at BCSC. He oversees the administrative investigators and litigators, the criminal investigation team, and the commission's collection agents actions. Before becoming the, becoming the Director of Enforcement, Mr. Muir was the Associate General of Counsel of the, in the Office of the Chair at the BCSC, where he provided legal, provide expert legal advice on a variety of matters, including administrative law procedures and privacy law. Prior to being Associate General Counsel, Mr. Muir spent seven years as Litigation Counsel with the litigation team of the BCSC's Enforcement Division, where he prosecuted a wide range of cases before the Commission Tribunal and argued cases in the B British Columbia courts. In today's webinar, Doug will speak on the investment fraud awareness and discuss how attendees can recognize, reject, and report investigation fraud. He will highlight the techniques fraudsters use and will discuss real life investment fraud cases that are specific to the Vancouver Island. For those of you joining us on Zoom, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. As the moderator, I will track the questions so that Doug has an opportunity to answer. For those of you joining us on Facebook today, you are welcome to submit questions, but please be aware that we are not monitoring the site regularly and may not get to your questions during this talk. With that, I'll pass things over to Doug. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invite and thank you to the Vancouver Island Regional Library. Just going to pull up my slideshow here. Good, well, thank you again. Thank you for the invite and uh, thank you for having the commission here. I'm looking forward to the presentation and I would encourage people to ask questions as well. I think after a while, they may get a little bit tired of my voice. So please put in your questions and we'll do our best to answer them. What I wanted to talk about today uh, was give you an overview of who we are and what we do. Uh, the areas that we that we regulate uh, and some techniques that we find that fraudsters are using for investment fraud and also some ways that you can try to prevent yourself from being defrauded. So this is the uh, Securities Commission's office. I haven't been there in a while, but uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, I have been uh, with Commission for about 16 years uh, in various capacities, a lot of it relating to um, enforcement. So I'll be focusing on enforcement today, but it's important to keep in mind that, of course, there's other divisions in the Commission that are critical for enforcing securities law. We have a division that deals with the companies that uh, issue securities. Uh, we call those issuers, so companies trying to raise money for the business. And we have a division that deals with the people who trade securities, so your brokers and your brokerage firms, and uh, also the securities exchanges as well. And finally, we have our communication education division, uh, and they communicate the work that we do at the commission and also provides education, including presentations like this one. So thanks to uh, Malk and Ken for putting, uh, putting this all together for us. So what, what is a security? So obviously we deal with securities. That's the name that's in our commission, the Securities Commission. And a lot of people probably know about stocks and bonds and promissory notes and, and a whole variety of named securities like that uh, that you would um, purchase to make an investment. It's a very broad definition what security means. And in addition to all those uh, clearly defined terms like stocks and bonds that people are familiar with, one thing that I like people to keep in mind is a security can also be if you give money to someone and expect something back like a return or a dividend or profit, that may be a security. And if that's a security, there's laws about trading that security and uh, we regulate that security and my division enforces those laws as well. 
So it's a, it's a complicated definition that I try to boil down so that people can have it in mind when it comes in front of them. And so it's important, again, to just think of these ideas that if you're giving money to somebody else and you're expecting something like a profit or return or a dividend, that might be a security. We would regulate that, and there's laws about who can trade those securities. I'll also add, uh, um, we also regulate something called derivatives, which are, I think, a more complicated investment, and I won't get into those uh, today, but that's also something you should, you should keep in mind as well. So this is our enforcement division, and so I'll walk through it in a second, but what's important to keep in mind that we have two streams in the enforcement division. We have one stream, which is on the left, which is our administrative stream. So that deals with administrative law. And we have another stream over here, which is our criminal stream. And so dealing with the administrative stream, one way to think about that is that's all in-house. So uh, we have uh, investigators that investigate matters administratively. We have litigators that litigate it. And we have hearings in front of our commissioners and they form a tribunal. There's usually three commissioners and we have a hearing that's just like a trial. We have a hearing room that's like a courtroom. And then the commissioners who are uh, hearing the matter, they can decide whether there's been any misconduct and they can also issue orders if there has been. So that's the administrative side. The criminal side's a bit different. The only thing that's in-house, so to speak, is the criminal investigation. So we have a team of investigators that investigate matters to the, um, the criminal standard and they refer those matters to Crown Counsel. And if Crown Counsel approves the charges, uh, then Crown Counsel prosecutes and that prosecution happens in the court. So there's a couple of key differences to keep in mind with these two separate streams. One has to do with the powers of the administrative investigators. So the Securities Act, which is the legislation that applies to us, gives those investigators powers to compel information. So they can require people to provide evidence and that can include the person who's the target of our investigation. On the criminal side, they don't have that power. They can't force people to provide information. They can't compel them to do that. They can get orders from the court to uh, require people to provide information. And people are probably familiar with a search warrant. It's an order like a search warrant. We do get search warrants now and again, but the court has to approve that. So that's one main difference. The second main difference is that in the criminal stream, there can be jail time at the end of it. A court can decide that uh, jail time is required for the misconduct and they can order someone to go to jail. The administrative stream, they can't do that. They can order financial penalties and they can ban people from the markets. So that's just very sort of a summary of sort of a criminal law and administrative law, the two separate streams. So we have at the top an intake and assessment group that uh, assesses information and brings that information, um, has a look at it and uh, assesses it and decides where it should go. And I'll pause there for a theme you may hear from me a few times in this presentation, which is information from the public is critical for us. We have a broad range of powers that we can use and tools we can take uh, advantage of to act quickly to stop misconduct. We can freeze assets if we know about them. But of course, that a lot of that depends on whether we get the information. So I encourage people, please report to us if you think you've been a victim of investment fraud or been approached with an investment fraud. Please contact us. The information's on our website, the bcsc.bc.ca. And there's also a slide later on I'll get to that has all the contact information for you. So from the, the intake and assessment stage, um, after that, it can go one of two places. It can go to our administrative stream or it can go to our criminal stream. And as I said before, on the administrative stream, it can then go to our litigation group and then there can be a, a hearing. And on the criminal side, it can go to Crown Counsel and then it can go to the courts. Uh, for a trial. Now, this is uh, the ideal world. It doesn't look like this all the time. No nothing's in a straight line and things may go, um, you know, to different groups and depending on uh, what the case is all about. Um, but in general, that's what, what the structure looks like for us. So I touched on what, to, what we can do. So again, when we, um, when there's been an investigation and a hearing and our commissioners find that there's been misconduct, they can issue trading bans. They can issue other bans prohibiting somebody from being an officer and director of a company, for example, from uh, participating in promoting securities. It's another ban that they can impose as well. 
They can impose monetary penalties. There can be uh, up to $1 million per contravention of the act. Um, what we can do in enforcement is we can freeze assets. So we have the power to freeze money. If we know about some misconduct going on and we don't want that money to go anywhere, uh, we can step in and, and uh, try to freeze it. And how that can play it out at the end is if, if we do get orders from our, our panel, monetary penalties, we can then try to use those frozen assets and try to get that money back to, to victims. Uh, another step that we often take is we will warn the public about suspicious investments or suspicious companies. And I'll get to the slides later where that information is on our website. Again, another theme you'll see me uh, promoting a lot is there's a lot of information on both of our websites, our investor education website and our other website. Uh, and one thing that's there is our warnings that we provide to the public. You can also subscribe to get warnings when they come out. So it's a tool we use because we can act quickly. If we get information in, uh, we can warn the public about it. And again, there's that key if we get that information in from the public. And then finally, the, the point that I made that we investigate matters, but we don't prosecute them criminally. We, we would send those to Crown Counsel for prosecution. What we don't do, we don't approve investments. We don't give investments or legal advice, and we don't undo a transaction. So we don't have those powers to do that. One, one thing uh, that I'll touch on here, which is important to, to point out, because we don't do those things, if you get a letter, let's say as an example, that uh, pretends to come from the commission saying things about your investment, that might be fake. And that's not something I've made up. We've had cases where people have used fake letters from the commission to provide to try to satisfy people that the commission is taking care of their interests and there's nothing to worry about, but that's fake. So I think that's why it's important to keep in mind what we do do and what we don't uh, in case you come across something like that as part of a, an investment that someone's trying to offer to you. So before I dive into investment fraud in detail, which is the, the subject of today's presentation, I'm just going to talk briefly about some of the other types of misconduct that we deal with. Often it's, it comes along with the frauds that we deal with, um, but it could be, be also standalone. And so two fundamental principles that I'll hit in a very general level so as we don't get into too much detail on the law. The two principles are you have to be registered to sell securities or advise people to purchase securities. And you have to have filed a document which is called a prospectus, which is a very long, lengthy document and a fairly complicated document. Before you sell the securities, that document has to be filed. Now there's exceptions to those requirements, um, but if there are no exceptions and someone's not registered or they haven't filed a prospectus, then that could be illegal. So how could that be important to you? Well, a very good question to ask if someone comes to you with an investment opportunity is to, are you registered to sell securities? If not, why not? And that's something that can help you go down the road of doing more research and looking into it. Similarly, if they talk about, uh, if you ask about a prospectus, have you filed a prospectus? And people say, no, we haven't. Well, why haven't you? Don't you have to? Doesn't law requirement? So there's some tools that you can use if, uh, again, if you're approached with an investment. Another type of misconduct that we deal with fairly often are misrepresentations. So those are fairly straightforward to describe. It's if someone said something that's untrue or they've omitted to say something that they needed to say when they were offering securities to you. So basically they've told lies. And another area of misconduct we deal with are uh, illegal insider trading, which people may hear about in the media, and also market manipulations, uh, pump and dumps, they're often called. Uh, and those deal with securities that are traded on stock exchanges. So uh, that's a whole other area of misconduct. Now that's not all of them. These are some of the ones we deal with most often, uh, but those are some of the ones, um, that's just some of the types of misconduct that we come across. But today we're going to focus on fraud. So I think it's important to keep in mind or, or to know about what is fraud. So fraud is fairly simple to describe. It's a very broad term. It's been around for a while. And of course, it applies not just to investment related fraud, but to fraud in general. And I would summarize it by saying it's taking something from someone else through dishonesty or deceit. To boil that right down, it's dishonest deprivation. So someone's done something deceitful to you or said something deceitful or dishonest and they've taken something from you. So some examples, um, you know, if someone is promoting something that doesn't exist, so the mine doesn't exist, the factory doesn't exist, the company doesn't exist, 
And yes, we've had examples of those. They fail to tell you something about uh, the investment that's important, like the company's bankrupt. That's something you'd want to know before you made an investment. They may say something that's untrue, like they have a cure for a disease or they have rights to a mine, something like that. Often, unfortunately, in the fraud cases we deal with, fraudsters will take your money and use it for their own purposes. They may use it for luxury items. Um, it's not unusual to see you know, restaurants or purchase other personal purchases, and they may put it into another um, place that has nothing to do with what you um, put your money in for. So it may be a different investment, it may be a different unrelated company, but basically the money goes somewhere else. So, assuming that hasn't frightened everyone too much, what can, we, uh, what can we watch out for? So these are from of our fraud warning signs. So we'll go through them and then uh, quickly and then go back and discuss them in more detail. So one is the trust trap. Two, high re returns, no risk or guarantee. Three is a fear of missing out or FOMO. Four is the pressure to buy. And five are questions not answered. So these are some of the techniques that we see fairly often in the frauds that we deal with. And one thing that strikes you if you look at them and think about them carefully, like I've done for many years, is a lot of these are about human nature and preying on human nature. I often call it the psychology of the situation. And as we go through them, I'll elaborate a bit on that. But that's one thing that's important to keep in mind. And often why it's important to keep to mind is because the investment itself that you're being offered, if someone's giving you a fraudulent investment, it rarely makes any sense. We have some very bright people in the commission who've tried to make sense of this stuff that fraudsters have said. It doesn't make any sense. So there's other factors that are at play when these people are promoting these things to you. And after years and years, I've, I've come to realize it's a lot about human nature. So if we think about the trust trap, the trust trap is a situation where someone you trust has brought to you an investment opportunity. And the trust could be developed through any manner of ways. It can be someone you've known for a long time. It can be a friend, a family member. It can be someone in your social group, cultural, religious group. It could be anything like that. And we've had examples of all of those. And what we find is that if someone who brings a, you trust, if they bring you an investment opportunity, you let your guard down. And you don't think about all the other things that you need to think about before you make an investment. Now, there's two scenarios that I just want to point out before so that people don't get too alarmed. You know, one scenario is the fraudster, someone who's you know, developed a relationship with you and is selling you that investment, the fraudulent investment, directly. So again, it may be somebody in one of your social groups. An another scenario, and this is the one where people get sometimes a bit concerned when we talk about it, it may be a friend or a family member, someone you know quite closely. So you may say, well, Doug, you're saying my friends and family members are fraudsters. Probably not. I'm not saying that they are. But they may be a victim of a fraud, and they may be bringing to you a fraudulent investment, and they don't know it. And why would they think that it's a good investment? Well, they have a document. They have an account statement. And this is how much money they've made. They put in $10,000 and in a month, they've got $14,000. What a great investment. And again, this goes to the human nature. They want to share that. They want to share it with people that they know and they care for. And they may bring it to somebody else, but they may not know that it's a fraud. So when a scheme is set up like that, it's ideal for the fraudster because the fraudster can stay in the shadows and let other people spread this fraudulent investment through the group. So the next warning sign is a high return and no risk or guarantee or low risk or risk-free or insured. And so you'll see what I'm doing is that sometimes fraudsters will pivot and say, well, I'm not going to say no risk because people are onto that. So I'm going to call it guarantee or I'm going to call it insured. The point is any investment has risk to it, any investment at all. So if someone says to you, here's a risk-free investment, Walk away, number one. And number two, please contact us because that's probably a fraudulent investment. So look out for variations of that. Risk-free, guaranteed, insured, get your money back. Anything like that, it's held in trust, it's safe. Anything to do with that is not true. And uh, 
as, uh, related to that, when you come to high return, if there's a high return being offered and investments can have high returns, there has to be a high risk. Those two things go together. So if someone says it's a high return, but it's not, it's not no risk, there's some low risk. You need to look at that very, very carefully. So the third one is fear of missing out. And again, this is the one that when I think about it, probably really goes to the human nature. It has a lot to do with peer pressure. You have people in your social group, people around you who have invested. And they may not be pressuring you directly to invest, but boy, it can be a tough conversation when you're around the table and they're talking all about their investments, how much money they've made, and here's a great opportunity. And they look over to you and say, how come you haven't bought? And this is a great deal. Why don't you do it? So again, it's some, some, some pressure there. Uh, and I think it's unfortunate that sometimes I think people would rather get rid of that pressure and make a bad investment than resist it and stay on the sidelines. So that's one thing to wash out as well. And fraudsters may use that, may use that as part of their pitch. Uh, fourth is a pressure to buy. Again, it may be get in now, get in quick, limited opportunity, select people only. Those kinds of words they may use, very suspicious of that. And then finally, questions not answered. So it may be a situation where the fraudster just simply doesn't answer your questions. You know, as part of your research before you make an investment, you want to ask a lot of questions to understand it. And the fraudster either deflects or doesn't answer them. Or another situation where they answer the questions, but you don't understand them. And what, what um, sort of aspect of human nature I think they play on there is that people are too embarrassed to ask. You know, someone's given them big words related to investments and they feel like they should know it, but they're too embarrassed to ask. So they kind of let it go and they may decide to get into the investment. So, but no, if you don't understand the investment, whether it's a fraudulent investment or a completely legitimate investment, you have to think very, very carefully before you want to get into that investment. So what do you want to do to protect yourself now that you have some of these warning signs out there? First of all, stop, just stop. Don't hand over your money. Don't write that check. Don't transfer that money. Do your due diligence. Do your research. Look into the investment. So think about two things. Think about the investment details itself. So your risk tolerance. You know, how, how, um, how much you are comfortable making a really risky investment. Your investment goals, your needs, your objectives. Your age. How long do you have to recover from a loss? Your financial situation. Your assets, your debt, your income, your savings. The investment itself, where's your money going? How is the return to be generated? When will you get paid and how? And who's behind the investment? Who's behind the company? Who are the officers and directors of the company? What do you know about them? And do your research into that. And I'll get a little bit later about where you can do that research, but you can search online. You can find a lot of information about people online. And the second thing to think about, the first thing is the investment details. The second thing, Think about the situation. So if you go back to the warning signs I talked about in the human nature that's uh, part of them, say, why am I interested in this investment at this time? Do I understand the investment? What other factors are going on that aren't related to the investment? For example, am I feeling pressured? Are my friends and family already into it? Is that a factor? Uh, do, do I not understand it, but I'm too embarrassed to ask questions? And the seller seems knowledgeable and friendly and successful. You know, is that something that's influencing my decision as well? So if you don't know about the investment and you can't make your decision, you could speak to a registered advisor. You know, they're there to help you to make investment decisions. And there's information uh, on our website, investright.org, about um, how to find an investor and how to deal with an investor and how to uh, develop a relationship uh, with your investor as well to help you make your investment decisions. And then the final thing is, you know, you know that's coming, please report it to the commission. If you think that uh, you've been approached with an investment fraud or you've been a victim of one, please contact us. And again, one thing I'll point out there, back to human nature, people are often embarrassed and they may feel dumb, they've been hoodwinked and um, that they don't wanna you know, tell anyone. They often don't tell their family, they don't tell their friends, they don't tell the people they're closest to. They don't wanna contact the commission. They'll often downplay it and say, it's not an awful lot of money. But I think it's important to keep in mind you know, you weren't defrauded because, uh, of, you know, you were, um, you know, maybe you acted stupidly. That's not the point. But unfortunately, you may have been defrauded because fraudsters are good at what they do. And they take advantage of these, you know, this human nature and these, uh, some of these techniques that I've talked about. So please, 
please contact us. Please let us know. As I said, we've got a wide range of tools and powers that we can make use of if we have information about it. So I'll move on then to a couple of case examples. And these both uh, were cases that uh, where the misconduct happened on the island. Uh, the first one is David Michael Michaels. And I should tell you, if you want more information about these cases, uh, it's available on our website. You can search the names and you can find out all the information that we have publicly available, including the decisions from our panel uh, and any other um, rela materials related to the hearing that are, that are publicly available. So uh, in this case, our hearing panel, again, that's made up of three commissioners and they um, held a hearing, it's like a trial, and there was evidence and witnesses, and then they make a decision. They found that uh, he had committed fraud, he had made misrepresentations, and he had acted as an advisor without being registered. Uh, he sold $65 million worth of securities. Uh, they were called exempt market securities, a, sort of a, a special type of securities, let's say. Uh, he sold that to 484 investors and made commissions of $5.8 million. Uh, the, the commission panel found that he uh, aggressively promoted his business. He did that um, a lot of the time he spent on the radio, you know, broadcasting a program. And he also held seminars and, uh, and had clients in and, and made the pitch there as well. Uh, in its decision, the panel found that his sales pitch was formulated to prey on investors uh, by frightening them into purchasing highly risky securities with little or no liquidity. In other words, he couldn't really sell them. And he also um, frightened people by saying that the more traditional investments like um, mutual funds and stocks and bonds weren't safe. He focused his efforts on uh, a certain age group and the average age of his clients was 72 years old. Uh, and at that age, a lot of investors have little or no opportunity to earn income from work or otherwise financially cover if they've lost, uh, lost their investment. So there were four, four areas of deceit that were part of this case. And you'll see some of the techniques that I talked about earlier. Um, so one, um, as I mentioned, he, he told lies about um, uh, traditional investments. Uh, he said his investments were less risky. Uh, and he said that advisors, advisors who recommended they buy stocks and bonds were less trustworthy. So that's not true. Um, he encouraged clients to leverage investments. And what that is, is they were borrowing money to buy their investments. And he did it without telling them the risks behind that strategy. And the, one of the risks behind that strategy is um, if you have, if you invest, if you do that and your investments go, you know, they, they, uh, you lose the money in your investment, you still have the loan. So that's where that gets risky. And some of his uh, clients ended up having, um, you know, loans they had to pay back, but the investments they ended up with were worthless. So, so the third thing was trust. So we had talked about the trust trap before where people get, trapped into investment because they let sort of the trust in the situation overwhelm uh, some of the other homework they should do before they invest. Um, he held himself out as a knowledgeable advisor uh, and as someone who knew the inside of the industry and knew all its dirty little secrets. Um, he, he also said often that he loved helping seniors make money, um, but that wasn't true. Uh, he actually admitted that he liked dealing with seniors because they were available during the day. They like to do his business during the day. And so uh, his final thing on the trust was he also told people that he invested in some of the very same investments that he was selling to them. So you can see how those things that he was saying would develop a trust relationship with these clients. They would come to trust him and uh, they may have made some of their investment decisions based on that trust relationship. And then finally, he made misrepresentations about the specific securities that he's sold. So he uh, said that a return was guaranteed. So there's one of the warning signs we talked about. Uh, he also failed to tell clients about the risk of an investment. And there's another one, um, risk there omitted to tell people about the risk. Uh, so again, so that case is an example of some of the warning signs that I've talked about before and things for you know, people to watch out for. And again, if you, if you wanna read the decisions, those are available on our website. Um, he had been uh, 
registered in the past. In fact, he had been sanctioned in the past as well. So uh, his, you know, misconduct, it was, uh, he had done things in the past as well. Um, and as I said, the, um, the panel had uh, ordered sanctions. So that's up on the slide now. They banned him permanently from the investment markets. They ordered him to pay a fine of $17.5 million and to pay um, the $5.8 million in commissions that he had obtained from his misconduct. So that's, that was the result in that case in the hearing. That is our hearing room there, in case you're wondering. Um, so I'll add a, just sort of where we're at now with that case. As I mentioned at the top, we also deal with collections at the commission in the enforcement division. So this case was around 2014 when it, it ended. Around 2015, uh, we started a couple of lawsuits to try to collect the amounts from Mr. Michaels. He, he had not paid them. And we uh, started lawsuits uh, against some of his property. And one uh, was a condominium he held, uh, he had in Hawaii uh, that he owned. Uh, in 2018, we settled those lawsuits and entered into an agreement with Mr. Michaels. And that included the sale of his condominium. And uh, as a result of that settlement, we ended up collecting $1.1 million uh, in funds. And that was for the benefit of the victims. So in early uh, 2019, uh, we had what's, um, we had a claims process and we had what's called a receiver run that process. And we returned that money uh, to the victims of his misconduct. So that's kind of where, where that one is at right now. So moving then over to the, the criminal stream, as I'd mentioned, uh, the Michael's matter was our administrative um, case, and this is a criminal stream. Um, Mr. Minnie understands from Parksville. Uh, in May of 2020, uh, he was sentenced to four and a half years in prison uh, for defrauding two BC investors of more than half a million dollars. Uh, and this is the longest sentence ever for uh, as a result of one of our criminal investigations. Doug, um, we yes. do have a question. Sure, please. And the question is, does the enforcement agency have the capacity to investigate in investments that might be overseas? Is the agency limited to just Canadian investments? Yes, we do. Um, and so th that's um, an issue called jurisdiction. So the question is, what matters can we look into? And it would depend on what's located in British Columbia. So we've had cases where um, uh, the misconduct happened in relation to a stock that was listed on the stock exchange that we regulate. And our panel said, you know, that's jurisdiction for us. We may have a situation where the person is here, the fraudsters in British Columbia, and they're selling outside British Columbia to people outside British Columbia. We may have victims here in British Columbia. So there's a variety of different ways that we would think we would have jurisdiction over a particular situation. If it's a situation where you know, nothing relates to British Columbia, it's unlikely we would have uh, the jurisdiction. But it's a very good question because one thing I didn't discuss, and I'll take the opportunity to do it now, that we are a member of, of a several international or national organizations. So we're a member of the Canadian Securities um, Administrators, which is the securities regulators across Canada. We work together often, we collaborate, we share information, we may refer a case. So a case may be better dealt with by our colleagues in Alberta or our colleagues in Ontario. We may put that matter there. We're uh, a member of an organization of the North American Securities Regulators, so the state regulators. Uh, there's a, the matter may be more appropriately dealt with by the state regulator and vice versa. They may send a matter to us. And we're also a member of an international organization as well of securities regulators. We often get information from them, share information with them, or ask them to get information for us. One of the one of the bases of the structure of our securities regulation and model and other regulators around the world is you help other regulators out, you get information. So we may conduct an investigation, for example, for the benefit of another regulator. Um, so that's a bit of a, a longer answer, but there's a couple of different ways we may deal with something that has a footprint in British Columbia and maybe parts outside British Columbia. Okay. And we also have another question, and this one is about recovering of uh, penalties and fines and whether they're ever fully recovered. 
And also, I believe this person is a little bit interested in the criminal action as opposed to administrative action, which I think the next example covers. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, okay. it is. Uh, so I'll deal with the criminal one in the, in the next slide, but in the collection, so we have um, a broad range of powers to try to collect money once a decision has been rendered, uh, been issued by the panel. Uh, and we recently got some more powers starting in March of this year. The legislature passed some amendments to our legislation. Um, and so we are, um, we're an awful lot like any other, what's called a creditor. In, in other words, someone who owes the money. Uh, we file our decision with the Supreme Court of British Columbia. And then we have a, a variety of tools that a lot of other people have as well to try to collect money against uh, people uh, who owe us sanctions. So we may uh, require them to do a, um, an interview and provide us information. We can get information from other parties. We can seize assets. We can sell assets. Um, we can freeze assets. Uh, so those are other tools that we have available. Unfortunately, we don't return, collect much money. Fraudsters don't have it. So we're like many, many other agencies and many other creditors. You often don't collect the money at the end of the day. So there's about $400 million that's outstanding just from a small group of people. And that's about 11 people, many of them who are fraudsters. And as an example of some of those, uh, you can find this information on our website as well. Some of those people are bankrupt. They're in jail. They may have large court orders against them that are unrelated to our orders, or they may be a combination of all three. So it's very unlikely that we'll be able to collect that money from them. So we take whatever steps we can in any case to try to collect money and try to get that back to investors. But unfortunately, a lot of the time when the money is, is gone, uh, the fraudsters have spent it and there's no money there to get back. And that does loop back to my theme I've been saying a few times, if you have information, please let us know. We can get freeze orders in place. We can stop that. We had a very large case where we ended up uh, freezing about $10 million because we got information in. We froze it. We did the investigation. We got orders. We then had a process where we returned uh, money back to victims as well. So very good question. Thank you. Any more there? Should we move on to the not at the moment. We may have some more coming in. I'll let you know. Thank you. So we were talking about the, about the mini case, and, and this is a, a variation of a, of a type of scheme, which unfortunately we see now and again, and it can be very painful for, for victims. It's called a re-victimization scheme, which is maybe too fancy a word for it. But it's a situation where someone who is involved in a fraud, not the victim, and maybe not the main person, but someone who is involved in it, the fraud collapses and that the person then approaches the, the victims of the fraud, to try, try to help them get their money back. That's what they're pretending to do. So they would often have information about the person. They may have contact information. They may know about their investment. They know, may know about some of the details that the fraudster was talking about. And there's a bunch of different ways this could play out. You know, someone may contact a victim and say, you know, look, I know you lost your money. Uh, we've got um, a process in place and we just need a, some money up front in order to make that happen or we're gonna retain a lawyer to do this for us and all act together. Um, you just have to pay $1,000 and you're in, you're part of the group, but if you don't pay it, then you're not part of the group. So, um, you know, you should pay us some more money and that money's gone as well. So again, please, if you've been victim of investment fraud, if you think you've been approached, then contact us. And if someone comes, comes to you and says, you know, I can help you get your money back, stop, think, go through the steps that I discussed before. So in this, this case here involving Mr. Minnie, uh, he'd been involved in a uh, fraudulent scheme in, in 2007. And the victims in that scheme were also the victims in his later scheme, which was around 2014 or 15. And he had told them that they could uh, recover their losses from the earlier scheme and also make substantial profits. Uh, he had said that there's a hedge fund in Venezuela uh, and that uh, they needed to put in some money in order to liquidate that hedge fund. And once it was liquidated, they could get their money back. Uh, but that hedge fund didn't exist. Uh, he didn't use any of their money as he said he would. Uh, he used it for stays at upscale hotels, on restaurants, meals, liquor, um, some other retail purchases, and also made a lot of cash withdrawals as well. So he was uh, arrested in... 
October 2017 by the Oceanside RCMP. Thank you for their assistance with that. Uh, and that was following our investigation into the, um, into the matter. Uh, in addition to his jail sentence of four and a half years, he was also ordered to repay the victims a total of about $540,000. So the, the, one, the one thing that uh, comes to mind with this case, and it wasn't a feature of this case as far as we know though, another technique fraudsters will often use is they'll try to scare people away from the commission. They may do it with threats uh, or they may make us out to be the bad person. And unfortunately, a lot of people, because uh, their investment is not doing well or they're worried about their investment, may decide to not come to the commission because what they're being told by the fraudster is, if you go to the commission, they're going to stop this or, you know, I won't give your money back because you've you know, tattletailed on me. So don't go and talk to them. Unfortunately, we deal with that fairly frequently. Uh, and that can be, a, you know, a, a block from people coming to speak to us. But please, we ask people to work through that and please contact us again if they do have this, this information. Um, it's a variation, again, of human nature of fear. So a lot of the fear-based scams we're worried about now have to do with the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, we have people, um, you know, fraudsters out there who are trying to make people panic and maybe making investments they shouldn't be making or making fraudulent investments because they're concerned about their, about their investments. So again, you're sick of me hearing this theme, but please, please contact the commission if you think you've been a victim of investment fraud. So that's an example of our criminal cases. Our historical criminal cases and our current cases are available on our website as well under the uh, enforcement tab. And you can find out what's going on with some of those cases there. So both of these cases that I talked about had some of these red flags. Uh, they weren't registered to sell securities. Uh, there was a high return with no risk or guarantee. Uh, and there was the trust trap as well. Uh, in addition, there's you know, other factors going on and with people when they were trying to make these investments, there was some fear there, some worry, some concern about their investments. And, uh, and that these were all elements of these schemes as well, things that we see fairly often. So what can people do? Well, I've certainly said it often enough, <laughs> please report to the commission. Um, but there's all sorts of tools that we have available for people to do their research and do their homework before they make any investments. This is our website here, uh, recently refreshed. It's only about, a, I think it's a week or so old. And there's lots of information available there for people to, um, to use to do their homework and do their research before they make an any investment decisions. One of those tools is, um, so here's our enforcement tab there. A lot of this information is available under our enforcement tab. One of the pages that you could find useful, it's got a search engine here, is our disciplined list. So we list there people who we've, we've disciplined if they've got orders against them or sanctions against them, uh, all the way back to 1987. So you could type the name in there and information will come up about that person if they've been sanctioned. So that's a great first step. It's a great any step, but it's not a bad first step. Check what information we have. Has the person been sanctioned? Have they committed misconduct before? That's one thing that's available on our website. This is the criminal enforcement page that someone was you know, asking about information about our criminal cases. It has some of the information there at the top that I've discussed and then a list of our current cases and further below also a list of our historical cases. Information is often available in, in our news releases. That's a good place if you wanna get a, a quick summary of what's going on in the case and also where the case is at and what's coming up on uh, with the case. Investment caution list, I touched on those briefly. Um, we may issue an investment caution list if we have some suspicion that people have been up to some misconduct and they're not registered in British Columbia. So there may be a website, for example, that is promoting Forex trading is a, is a fairly um, common thing right now or, or um, cryptocurrency trading, for example. And if those person needs to be registered and they're not, we may put out a, a, add them to the investment caution list and say, hey, 
everyone be careful, this person's not registered here. We know that someone's been approached in British Columbia or British Columbia residents could invest in this. So please be careful. Uh, and again, you can search these here. You can sign up for uh, notices from the commission if you want to get the email notifications out of um, a lot of our activity. Uh, it's a good way to keep in touch with what, uh, what we've been up to. So moving then to our other website, this is investright.org. So this is a fantastic website for investor education, tips, tools, calculators, videos, um, all sorts of information is there for people. It's a great place to start. Um, it's got a lot of um, pages where you can, it'll walk you through the steps you should be taking. A lot of links to other information. Um, this one here, I'll point it out and I won't say it. Again, report a concern here. And that's a tab that'll take you to an easy way of providing us with the information. It can be online. You can call us. You can also mail in information if you want. So that's investright.org. Here's an example of one of the pages here. So this is the advisor check. You can check whether someone's registered. You may recall when I uh, early on, I said that you have to be registered to, to uh, sell securities unless there's a reason you're exempt from doing that. You should ask why they're not, but here's a way to check to find out whether someone's registered. You can check to see whether they have any disciplinary history. Searching the internet, not a bad way to find some information about somebody. And then here again is, a, is a, um, one of the tips that we have here is interview the advisor. Before you enter into a, you know, a financial relationship where they're giving you advice, interview them, talk to them. It's an important decision, important decisions that you'll have to make about a very important part of your life, which is your life savings. So it's very important to be cautious before you uh, enter um, into an arrangement with an advisor. And here's some ways that you can go about that and things to look for. And here it is, the online complaint form. So again, you can submit a tip, uh, report a complaint, and then it'll walk you through uh, the form as you fill out the information. And that will come into our inquiries group and they may move it to whatever part of the commission is best suited to address that complaint. A lot of them come to enforcement. Um, a lot of them would go to other parts of the commission as well. And some of them aren't, uh, don't fall within our, our, um, our area, but we would try to help and, and say, you know, what agency you should contact or who else you can, um, you can speak to about the problem that you're having. And this is, uh, again, the information I'd, I'd mentioned at the top. Here's a way for you to get in touch with us our inquiries number, our inquiries email. And these are the publications that you can register to receive as well. Um, we've got all, all manner of um, social media communications out there and blogs uh, and um, videos that are on our website. Um, some of them involving yours truly, I'm sure if you wanna see more of them, some of, more of our advertisements as well uh, for investor protection. And that's all available on our invest, uh, invest right website as well. So that was all the information that I had, um, but I'm certainly open for any questions that anyone has or anything people want me to elaborate on. All right, so do feel free to, oh, we have a question. Um, the question is, I'm still not clear on why the criminal option was chosen. Remind us why, why we went to the administrative action instead of the criminal action. I think, I think they're speaking about when um, you went into detail about the administrative action as opposed to the criminal action. Right, right. So I'm happy to elaborate a bit on that. I, I kind of touched it on it on a high level, but there's a bit more detail to that. And one way to think about it is, uh, is evidence. So I touched briefly on one aspect of evidence is how we can gather evidence. So in the criminal stream, we can either get it voluntarily or we can get it from an order from the court, a search warrant. But in order to get a search warrant, we have to have some information before. So if you think about it, if we don't get any information voluntarily or not enough information to satisfy a judge, then we don't have that as an option. Another uh, aspect of the evidence that is important is what we can do with that evidence. So, and it, excuse me, in the administrative stream, we can tender more evidence <clears throat> at the um, hearing than we can at a trial, <clears throat> excuse me. Then we can at a trial of a criminal matter. So um, let's take another step back. The charter rights um, all apply in a criminal proceeding, but not an administrative proceeding. Uh, and so it's a lot more restrictions on what we can do with that evidence. <clears throat> 
And then finally, um, if you look at what the evidence has to prove, and this gets into a bit more of the technicalities of the law, um, but in the administrative proceeding, we have to prove things to a standard called a balance of probabilities. So more likely than not that something happened. On the criminal side, we have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. So why I walked through that is to say that a lot of it has to do with the evidence. If we can't get the evidence at the outset, we probably can't do a criminal investigation. We may have evidence, but it may not satisfy that higher burden that we have in the criminal matter, or we may not be able to use that evidence. So there's certainly a lot more evidence gathering tools in the, um, in the, um, a lot more evidence gathering tools on the criminal side. Oh, and then they, they said, thank you. That's an excellent answer to that satisfied their question. But we do have another one that came up. Do you investigate more personal frauds? For example, I read about an older man who was sending money to a woman he met online. It turned out there was no woman. Would that fall under your jurisdiction? Good question. Uh, and so the question is, it really goes back to whether it's a securities involved. And so the way we would probably look at that is to say, uh, what was being offered? Was this an investment? And, and what was it? Um, and that would be the starting place for it. And so if, uh, if so, you know, if it is a security, then it would fall within our area. And then we would probably then look at the, what I call the jurisdictional issues. So what's the connection to British Columbia? Um, if, we, um, if we have a lot of connection to British Columbia, then that's a case we may want to investigate. If another one of our fellow regulators has more of a connection, uh, let's say the company involved is in a different, a different uh, country or different province or state, uh, we may ask them to look into the matter. Uh, if we know where the person committing the misconduct uh, is located, uh, that location may be a better place to deal with the matter. Um, there are also, it's not uncommon, we have a situation where a, we have one British Columbia victim, but 12 Ontario victims. So the Ontario Securities Commission may be in a better place to deal with that. But again, collaboration amongst our colleagues, uh, share information, we cooperate, we assist whenever ways that we can. Um, but that's generally speaking how we'd probably approach a, an issue like that. Okay, another question. Um, if the BCSC has no jurisdiction in a suspected personal fraud, does BCSC have referral resources? Referral resources? Um, places people can go in those kind of situations. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if it's a matter we think the, um, you know, the police should be handling, we'd refer it to one of our police colleagues. Uh, we would probably find the jurisdiction that they're located in. We've, uh, we have some great help from the police on the island. Uh, we've, we've worked with them a lot. Uh, and, you know, thanks for all their assistance and all, all the matters we've dealt with. We may, we may tell the person who's got the complaint to go speak to the police in that jurisdiction. It may fall under the area of a different regulator. So um, there may be a different regulator that deals with the particular person involved, uh, another financial regulator. It may be a bank, for example, um, and we could refer that person to, to them. So if we get an inquiry in and our inquiries, people who, who receive the inquiry say, you know, look, you know, it's not security, but, um, you know, we think it's this agency here. We refer you to, you know, we'd ask you to contact that other agency. They're probably in a better position to help you. And of course, you can always speak to a lawyer as well. There may be situations where you should get some legal advice to find out what your options are and what your remedies are. Uh, it's important because when you're in a, if you're having, um, speaking to a lawyer and doing a civil proceeding on your own, that's a proceeding for your sake. That's for your benefit. We do all that we can to try to get money back to investors, but it's a different type of proceeding. So it's something to always keep in mind. So we've now have three on the table. There's a criminal proceeding, a civil proceeding, which is a lawsuit where you sue somebody, and then our administrative proceeding as well. So those may all be options, but certainly the one you would have the most control and influence on would be the civil proceeding as well. So, but they still should uh, contact, bring it to you guys' attention and you can then refer them to another That's correct, yeah, yeah. Because if we go back to some of the definition of security, um, you, people may think, oh, it doesn't say the word stock or share or you know, particularly nasty thing that uh, fraudsters will do. They'll write on the bottom of the document, this is not a security. Well, that's not conclusive, right? So it's good for people to contact us and we can help make that determination on whether it's a security or not and whether we have jurisdiction over it. Okay, thank you. We're not getting any yet, but we do have a few more minutes. Is there any other additional information you would like to share with us? And just in case we have any questions that pop up or? Um, I would just, just again say that, um, you know, there's lots of information on our webs website. Our communications and education group does a fantastic job of having all sorts of information there that people can start, start down the journey themselves. 
and figure out how to make themselves protect themselves as much as possible from investment fraud. Um, there's all sorts of uh, tools and tips and techniques that I haven't talked about that are on our InvestRight website. So that's a great resource for people to go to. Again, on our other website, the BCSC website, you can find information about hearings that are going on and the results of some of these hearings. The decisions often go into a fair amount of detail. So if you want to get some more idea of you know what things that we see and the evidence that we present in our hearings, you know, all, decisions are available if you if you want to read them. Some of them are quite lengthy and some of them are fairly technical, but um, some of them give you an idea of what you may experience and what you could get exposed to in a fraudulent investment scheme. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, um, I think we'll, we'll leave it at that then. Thank you, Doug, for your time today for sharing this important information with us. If, you, if anyone missed part of the talk or wants to watch it again, please feel free to join our Vural Professional Series, our face, Facebook page, where we will be posting this discussion. It will also be available on the Burl YouTube channel. If your question wasn't answered today or you're watching this after the live event and you want to ask a question, please feel free to forward that question to inquiries at bcse.bc.ca. And that was the address available in the second to last slide of, of Doug's presentation. And thank you all for joining us today. We're very, very glad you could. Thank you.